Welcome back. In this lecture, I'm going to talk all about buying vehicles. Now, this is my favorite lecture of the entire class because, in my opinion, vehicles is a place in our finances where we have the most inefficiency. We spend a lot of money, but we don't necessarily get a lot of value back. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about why that happens and what we can do to prevent that. So this chart should give us a hint on what we're going to talk about here. So this shows the average cost of a car over the first five years that it's owned. And a lot of times when we talk about buying cars, we're like, we're very worried about how much the insurance will cost. We're very worried about the interest. We're very worried about maintenance. We're worried about fuel economy. Those are all fine things to worry about. But if you look at this chart, you can see that those expenses are not the biggest problem, are they? The biggest expense on this chart is depreciation. What does that mean? Depreciation is when the price of something goes down over time. So you may have heard something like, the price of a vehicle goes down 20% the moment you drive it off the lot. Some version of that sentiment exists almost everywhere. Almost everyone's heard somebody say something to that effect. So we know that new cars lose a lot of value very fast. But we still run out to the car dealerships to buy them. The question is why? Let's look at how expensive this truly is. So this chart shows you that after one year, on average, cars lose 20% of their value. Now that's average. Some cars will lose more, some will lose less. But what that means is we value a car that is brand new 27% more than we value a car that is one year old. That's us voting with our wallets. As a people, as a society, consumers have decided that brand new cars are worth 27% more than cars that are one year old. And there's a number of reasons why people feel this way. We worry that they're not as uh, safe. We worry that they're not as reliable. We'll have more maintenance. Uh, maybe we're concerned about getting the warranty and the warranty is valuable for us. Yeah, those are all valid reasons to prefer a brand new car over a slightly used one. However, we need to balance that benefit against the cost. And so as we've talked about in other lectures and other videos, it's not really so much about what you choose to spend your money on. If you really value having a new car because it makes you feel safe when you drive, you don't feel safe when you're driving a used car, then it may be worth buying a brand new car and facing that depreciation. But you need to know what it's going to cost you. So you can decide, is it worth it, right? Is that peace of mind worth how much it will cost me? Consumer Reports study concluded that in the end, it's almost always less expensive to hang on to your current car than to buy a new one. Even the most expensive repair bills for an old car can't outweigh the cost of depreciation on a new one. So I'll give you an example. I had a car that needed the transmission repaired. And by the time I paid for a tow truck and a rental and all these other bits and pieces, it cost me about $2,000. And we legitimately question, should we just get rid of the car and buy something else? Should we replace it? Or should we just pay this huge repair bill? But I sat down and I looked at the numbers and replacing the car would have cost me not $2,000, but like fifteen dollars or $20,000. And so the repair bill was far, far cheaper than the cost to buy a new one. And so we repaired the car. And we kept it for many, many years after that, and it continued to run well. It just had one problem. And that's what this Consumer Reports study is finding, is that the repairs tend to not cost nearly as much as the depreciation on a new car. The problem is depreciation is kind of tricky. You don't have to write a check every month for your depreciation. It doesn't come out of your budget. When do you actually feel the pain of the value of your car going down? It's not every month. It's when you sell the car. So when you sell the car, you get shocked. How is my car worth so little? And that's when you face the depreciation. So that's the big expense that tends to do so much damage to our finances, that sneaky little depreciation, the cost that we all know about that don't seem to put a lot of value on. Now, when you're going to buy a car, you need to think about where you want to shop. So these types of stores listed on the screen, franchise dealerships, superstores, independent used car lots, and private individuals, are ranked in order from most expensive but most convenient to least expensive and least convenient. So if you go to a franchise dealership, you'll go in, they'll give you some popcorn and a soda, 
And if you just agree to everything they say, you can be in and out in an hour. They'll sign all the paperwork, they'll transfer all the title, they'll do all the inspection. You don't have to worry about a thing. You just walk in, get pampered, get a car, and leave. But you pay for that privilege. You pay for that convenience. It may be worth it to you. It may not be. But it's worth shopping around to see what the alternatives are. On the other end of the spectrum, buying from a private individual, say from Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or something like that, you can save a lot of money, but you're going to have to do all the work yourself. You're going to have to get a cashier's check. You're going to have to do the paperwork to transfer the title. If you need a loan, you're going to have to find your own loan and make, make arrangement for that money to get transferred. So it's a lot more work and a little bit more risk. And so you need to decide, is it worth paying that much? Or do I want to go to like a superstore like CarMax, where I can get a little bit better of a price, but I still get a lot of the conveniences of the dealership. And so there's nothing inherently wrong with any one of these ways to shop. Just be aware, how much am I willing to pay for various levels of convenience? All right, you figured out the car you want. How do you actually negotiate the purchase? This is our key point. Discuss the price first, not the financing, not the trade-in, and certainly do not discuss the payment you can afford. Okay? And the reason for this is because the payment is super easy to manipulate. Okay? It hides the cost. They can change the end, they can change the present value, they can change the future value, they can change the interest rate. They can manipulate all those pieces of the time value of money to get that payment exactly where you want. And just because you have a low payment doesn't mean you have a low cost for the car. So take your financial calculator in and make sure the salesperson sees it. Make sure they know that you are someone who knows what they're doing and that they can't trick you or take advantage of you. I have a story from when I bought a car at a dealership that kind of illustrates this process for you. So I did all my research in advance and I had a few number of cars that I was interested in and I had done the research. I knew the blue book value or the fair price of the cars that I was interested in. And so I went into the dealership armed with this information. Now they had a car that fit my criteria and that I was interested in buying. So I said, hey, well, let's go inside and let's talk about buying this car. So I walk in with my wife and we're sitting down talking to the salesperson. He gets up, goes to his computer for a minute, comes back with a printout and says, oh, good news. The payment on this car is only $275 a month. Isn't that affordable? And I thought, I didn't say, but I thought to myself, how do you know what's affordable for me? You don't know what my budget looks like. I didn't say that, but I thought it. What I said was, I don't care. I don't care about the payment. And he said, what? What do, you, what do you mean? You don't care about the payment? And I said, I don't care about the payment. What's the price of the car? Let's talk about the price of the car. And he said, oh, I don't know what the price of the car is. The computer just said the payment is $275 a month. Isn't that affordable? And I said again, I don't care about the payment. Tell me the sales price. What is the price of the car that you put into this calculator? You had to put something into your computer to get a number out. What number did you put in? And he said, oh, well, I don't know that. The computer just tells me. I can tell he's not going to tell me. So I go along and say, all right, fine. Uh, now, is this a five-year loan? He says, yes, a five-year loan. He's relieved. Yes, it's a five-year loan. I said, okay, and what, what interest rate did we get on the loan? He said, oh, okay, and he tells me the interest rate. I said, great, and then I pull out my calculator, and he goes, ah, oh. because he knew he'd just been caught. So I pulled it out my calculator, I put in those numbers, calculated the present value, and turned around and showed him and said, hey, why are you charging me $18,000 for this car? I'm not, that's not a fair price for this car. And he's like, oh, well, that, that can't be right. That doesn't seem right. Let me go check on that. So we went back and forth, and I went through several managers. Three hours later, one of their salesmen finally says, tell you what, um, what if we sold you the car for $11,000? See, they knew that I caught him. They were trying to trick me on the price. I knew the fair value of the car was $14,000. So when he offered $11,000, I discussed it with my wife, and ultimately we agreed to buy the car for that price. So that's the story of how my financial calculator saved me $7,000 plus interest on a car. 
And that illustrates for you why it's important not to discuss the payment because they were overcharging me a lot for this car. But if I had just taken the payment and said, well, yeah, I can afford 275 a month, I would have wound up paying far more for the car than I actually had to. Make sure you negotiate well and don't talk about the payment because if you get the price of the car right, if you've done your research, you know what interest rate you can expect to be offered, then you know what price you can get. Right? So if the sales price is right, and the interest rate is fair, then the payment will be fine. And so do the affordability calculations before you go in. Pull out your textbook, do the affordability calculations, make sure you're brushed up on how to do that, decide how much you can afford, and go in and negotiate to that price. And don't fixate on the payment, because the payment hides the true cost. A few more tips to give you about negotiating for a car. First, remember that no car is truly unique. And the manufacturer builds millions of each car each year. So if you walk in and they're giving you a hard time, and oh, this is the only one car like this, okay, just go away. Just leave because it's a lie. There are lots of Honda Civics and Toyota Corollas and CRV. There's tons of every car out there. You don't have to let yourself be pressured or confused or overwhelmed. You don't have to do that. The car you're looking at is not the only one around. You probably can go right next door. Car dealerships tend to be close to each other. You could probably just literally walk next door and find the same car. Okay. So if they're not treating you well, don't put up with it. They have no power in the negotiation. The buyer has all the power in the negotiation. They have no unique car to offer, so don't let them trick you into thinking they do. Also remember that no sale is truly unique. I like the joke, what month is truck month? Because if you watch commercials, you'll see, oh, it's truck month at your local Ford dealership. It's truck month at your local Chevy dealership. And they're having a big sale on trucks. The reason that this is a joke is because every month, as far as I can tell, is truck month. There's always a sale. If it's not an October Palooza, then it's a Thanksgiving special. If it's not a Thanksgiving special, then it's a December to remember. If it's not a December to remember, it's a, it's a New Year January sale. There's always a new sale. If they can offer you one price in November, they can offer you that same price in December. Don't let them back you into a corner, making you think that you have to act now. If you have to act now, then it's probably not that great a deal. Step back. Remember, you have the power. There are lots of this car and there's lots of sales. If a dealer won't deal with you, if they won't work with you, then go to the next dealership until you find someone who will treat you with respect and give you a fair price. I talked earlier about how much a car depreciates in the first year. Let's look at the impact and long-term cost of that depreciation. So this is a spreadsheet I built to illustrate a car strategy. So here's what we're gonna do in this strategy. Ordinarily, most people buy a new car, keep it for five years, and then after five years, they buy a new car again. That's kind of a typical pattern. What we're gonna do with this strategy is just make one little tweak. Instead of buying brand new, we're gonna buy two years used. So if you're watching this in 2020, that would mean instead of buying a 2020 car, you'd buy a 2018 car. Two years used, that's what we're gonna do. Every five years, you're going to sell your car and buy another two year used car. Every five years, you're going to replace your car with one that's two years old again. And this means that you're never driving a car that's more than seven years old. In this strategy, you can still use a car loan. So you're going to take out a car loan to buy your car every five years. So let's look at how this works. So in this example, I've got a Ford F-150 XLT. This is a pretty nice truck. Okay, and brand new, the price is about $34,000. The price for a two-year used one was $25,700. These are the actual numbers that I looked up at the time of this recording. Now we're going to take a loan to buy these cars and we're going to pay 5% interest. And what we're going to do is if you see here for the new car, the monthly payment is $651 a month. For the slightly used car, it's $485 a month. That gives us a difference of $165 a month. So 
what we're doing is we're assuming I can afford 651 a month, but I'm not going to spend all that on my truck. Instead, I'm going to buy two years used and save $165 a month in my retirement account. Okay, so the 650 a month, we're going to pay that, but instead of paying all of it for the truck, we're going to pay some of it for the truck and some of it we're going to save. So at the beginning, we're going to save $165 a month. And that savings is going to earn 8% interest. So if we do this over time, you can see that our balance goes up. After five years, you can see we, this is where we trade in our car. We get a new one. Or not a new one, a two-year used car. And so the payment went up. The re reason the amount we're saving goes up is because of inflation. But this is the difference between a brand new car and a two years used car five years from now. And so we're going to save it and it's going to continue to grow. And if we go all the way to the bottom, after 40 years, you see here we have $780,000 saved for retirement. The average amount of money that someone has saved for retirement right now is only $50,000. So then doing this strategy puts you way, way ahead of the curve. Now, maybe you're thinking, hold up, what about maintenance though? A used car has more maintenance. Let's say that every five years, your used car has $5,000 in repairs that the new car wouldn't have. This is a very high number. Let's just be conservative and say it's $5,000. And so what the spreadsheet is doing is every five years, it's subtracting $5,000 from your retirement account. You're withdrawing it to pay to fix up the car. So how big an impact does that have? Well, after 40 years, you wind up with $541,000. Even with this very large difference in the cost of repairs, you still have half a million dollars saved for retirement. And all you've done, the only thing you've done different from your friends and neighbors, is you buy a car that's two years used instead of brand new. That's the only difference. This $500,000 comes completely from investing the depreciation. That's it. Now you can enhance this Maybe you keep your car 10 years. Maybe you could buy a car that's five years used. Maybe you never use a loan, so you never have to pay interest. There are ways you can actually enhance this and get even more efficiency, but this is the cost of depreciation on a Ford F-150 XLT over 40 years, say from age 25 to 65. A couple of things I want to point out here. First, this is for one car. Many households have two cars. If you're doing this with two cars, the difference doubles to a million dollars. The other thing I want to point out is that it is very important that you save the difference. If you don't save the money and let it earn interest, you only wind up with $142,000, which is still a good amount of money, but it's not anywhere near half a million dollars, is it? And so you actually have to save the difference. So you have to have $650 a month to spend on your truck and choose to only spend $485 a month by buying slightly used. What are, what are we actually giving up then? Well, one of these trucks is brand new, the 2020 Ford F-150 XLT, and one is the 2018 Ford F-150 XLT. Can you tell the difference between these cars? In driving them and looking at them, they're very, very similar. There may be some differences, and, and obviously there are some instances where a particular car has been completely revamped in the this year, and so the slightly used one is significantly different. Uh, but in most cases, it's not really that much of a difference, is it? I'll bet most of you can't even tell the difference and couldn't be, begin to guess which one of these is new and which one of these is two years used. So if you buy used and invest the difference, you get $500,000 and what you give up is the difference between these two trucks. Maybe you're thinking, you know, that's all well and good, except I can't afford $650 a month for a, a nice truck. Does it still work with a less expensive car? So here we have from the same analysis for a Toyota Corolla. It's a much less expensive car, $20,000 new. The used is about 13000 so you have a smaller difference in price, and so you save less. Do you still get the same result? The answer is 
you still get a really good result. You're close to $400,000 here in your retirement account when you go to retire at age 65. So it still works. It's not quite as powerful. But again, if you have two Corollas and you're doing this over your life and you're avoiding losing out on that depreciation, you're investing that depreciation instead, you're still going to have somewhere around $800,000 saved for retirement. And the only thing you've done is buy a two-year-old car instead of a brand new car. That's the only thing you've given up. That, to me, makes a lot of sense. To me, that's a very, very small price for a very large reward. And that's exactly the type of situation you're looking for with your money. You want to pay a low price and get a lot of benefit for it. And this situation fits that perfectly. So this is just one strategy. Again, I mentioned you can do a 10 years, right? You trade in your car every 10 years. You can do where you don't take out a loan so you never have to pay interest. There's a number of different strategies you can use. But by avoiding that depreciation, investing the difference, you can go a long, long, long way towards having a secure retirement.